Thank you for asking me here today to speak with you about how CMB has affected my family. I'd like to begin with redirecting your frame of reference. So if I can ask you all to think of a time in your past, present or future, when creating a family would be at the forefront of your life. Imagine for, your mo for a moment, if you will, that you have never heard of CMB. You and your partner would love to have another baby and so are completely overjoyed to discover that you're expecting twins. To ensure your children will have the best and healthiest start, you take heed of all the medical advice given to you. Healthy diet, folic acid, no deep sea fish, no shellfish, no soft cheese, no processed meat, no alcohol, no avoid toxic fumes including cigarette smoke and avoid cat litter. You've done everything you could possibly do. Eight and a half months and a whole lot of discomfort later, your twins are both the size of a singleton pregnancy when they are born. Apart from requiring observation and some extra oxygen in special care nursery, they are perfectly healthy. Everyone is over the moon with happiness. While in hospital, the twins have their hearing screened and unfortunately, they both fail. A few days later, in your head home with your newly expanded family, your biggest concern being how on earth you're going to manage two at the same time. Another three days and you're back at the hospital for the twins repeat screening test for their hearing. They fail again. This time they are referred for an auditory brainstem response, ABR test, at the larger hospital. About two weeks and four hours later, you and your partner are sat down and told that while one of your twins has a temporary conductive loss, the other has a permanent sensory neural hearing loss, moderate in the left ear, moderate to severe in the right ear. <coughs> CMV is a possible cause. It's the biggest cause of non-genetic hearing loss. Do you want to test for it? At this point, you still don't know anything about CMV, apart from being told that if your child does have it, the hearing could get worse. Although many in a similar situation may not choose to, you decide to do the test. At some point in the conversation, you are gently warned, don't Google. Following this, you find yourself holding your three-week-old down on a table while a pathologist <coughs> draws blood for a test, and later you collect your, a urine sample, which you drop off to your GP to be sent off for more testing. What is CMV? Google. Hearing loss, vision loss, intellectual disabilities, gastrostomy, free feeding tube, small head, and large liver or spleen, non-verbal, epilepsy, microcephaly, stunted growth, cerebral palsy, death. Breathe. Can't be CMV, my child only has a moderate hearing loss. You're starting to get a little anxious. You ring the office of your GP and speak with the secretary. Do they have the results back yet? The doctor is with the patient. The results were positive. This in turn leads back to a hill prick test, also known as the Guthrie card, which you all know, which was done at birth. The blood is tested for CMV, a PCR test. A couple of months later, you get some great news. The PCR test came back negative. Maybe the twins picked up CMV after being born. Not long after this, your child has a CT scan to look at their cochlea in relation to their hearing loss. It's difficult to put your five month old down and watch as they panic before falling asleep with a mask delivering them gas. Another week or two later, and you're back at the hospital to get the results of the CT scan from the infectious disease specialist. <clears throat> After reading the report, the specialist has brought up on his computer screen. <coughs> he clears his throat and starts to slowly explain that the PCR test is not always accurate. The CT scan found calcification deposits on your baby's brain. They are remnants of a past infection. CMV is the cause of the hearing loss, and there is a 40% chance that your baby's hearing will deteriorate. There is also a very real risk of developmental delay, epilepsy, and we should get your baby's eyes checked as well. There's a lot to be hopeful about though, because although a little behind developmentally, your baby isn't showing signs of anything else at this stage. And thankfully, Emmeline seems to be asymptomatic, without symptoms. You should monitor her hearing though, as she has a 10% chance of late onset hearing loss. 
we'll just have to wait and see. I cried all the way home. This is how I first heard of cytomegalovirus. From Jennifer CMB. A week before Christmas, two thousand. Yeah, sorry. A week before Christmas, two thousand and ten, when William was still only six weeks old, he was sporting his first pair of funky purple hearing aids. You would not believe how many times purple hearing aids can actually be misplaced or lost in one year. <laughs> We have had to search for them in all sorts of places, under lounges and cushions, in Will's cot or our bed, in the car, under the car, and even in the Lego box. Their durability has certainly been tested as well. Having fallen into William's vomit, caused by reflux many times, and having Emma pulling and tugging at them, much to William's dismay, only to try and put them into her mouth. But the questions and our fears ensue. Does he have an intellectual disability? Will he end up with epilepsy? Can he hear? Mm -hmm. Will he be able to hold his head up? Will he be able to sit? Will he be able to feed himself? Is his hearing deteriorating? Will he ever crawl? Will he ever walk? Will he make friends at preschool? How am I going to get out? How am I going to get him out of nappies? Will he ever talk? Will the tantrums ever stop? Will we ever be able to reason with him? How big is that gap going to be? After seven months of frustratingly flat tym tympan tympanometry tests, including a conductive loss most likely due to blue ear, and often questionable audio-verbal therapy responses, such as a tiny eyebrow rise, which are almost painful to witness, William finally had grommets put in both ears. Afterwards, however, his responses didn't improve as we had hoped they would. He then had a visual reinforcement orientation audi audiometry test, ROA, or puppet test, which was deemed unreliable, and five cortical auditory evoked potentials. In the last test carried out, he wasn't able to detect sounds T, G and M at 75 decibels. And with his hearing aid set to a hearing loss between 90 and 120 decibels. So basically, if a jet plane was 20 metres away, William probably would have been lucky if he heard it at all. To put it simply, I was devastated. I thought I was prepared for this result since I was almost expecting it and so was surprised and confused with my own reaction. But as my GP said to me, you can put the armour on to help protect yourself, but it doesn't stop the force of the blow. That week I became an emotional mess, feeling quite disconnected from friends and family in my life that were going about living their normal lives. I felt so alone and the only people that understood were other mums who have gone through or are going through something similar. Following this, William had a repeat ABR test confirming that his hearing had deteriorated and he was now profoundly deaf. He then had an MRI scan which revealed that his auditory or vestibular cochlear nerves were intact. It also showed that he had reduced brain volume and more fluid than they were supposed to be. We didn't know what this would mean for William, except that he would now be approved for bilateral cochlear implants. On December 8, 2011, William had a five hour operation for bilateral cochlear implants. And on the 22nd of December, he had them switched on, receiving his gift of sound just in time for Christmas. Luckily for William, his development has continued to progress, albeit slowly and with lots of early intervention. We started with auditory verbal therapy at the Shepherd Centre, but as it became more and more obvious that his challenges were going to be much more complicated than at first thought, we moved to Matilda Rose in Waverley, which is now under the RIDBC umbrella, the Royal Institute for Deaf and Blind Children. For the last two and a half years, I've been taking William on the 45 minute drive each way to two days a week. On Tuesday, he has physiotherapy. On Thursdays, he has therapy with a special needs educator. He also has occupational therapy and group therapy on the same day. 
and until this year were attending Lifestyle Wednesday mornings. We've also seen other OTs and physiotherapists prior to them being available through Matilda Rose, and we're now seeing a private speech therapist on a Monday afternoon as well. As you can imagine, my life has been turned upside down. I'm a stay-at-home mum parent, as well as a therapist and case coordinator for all of my son's early interventions. Not to forget a cochlear implant tracker, since retention seems to be an issue we aren't getting rid of anytime soon. <laughs> It's not a job I would have picked. It's not a job any of us would pick. I have found anxiety, depression, and weight gain more difficult to manage over the last four and a half years. And so I'm very, very thankful for antidepressants, given that the last four years has at times been more than I could manage by myself. Given the topic is how CMV affected my family, I decided to interview a few other members to include their thoughts. When I asked Ellen, my eight-year-old, she said that it's hard because mummy doesn't have as much time for the rest of us kids because of William's therapy. My six-year-old, Grace, said she thinks it's really cool that the cochlear implants help William to hear, and it's also cool that he has a metal plate in his head, <laughs> but she kind of wishes he didn't as well. She added that when William plays with her, he doesn't mean to hurt her. When I asked Emmeline, William's twin sister, to answer the same question, she replied with, William hurt me. <laughs> to clarify this, in case any of you are concerned, I'd like to add three points. Firstly, William is a boy. He likes things like cars, balls, and wrestling. Secondly, he's a solid four and a half year old boy whose global development is similar to a two-year-old's level. Plus, his proprioception isn't so great. The grey between light and heavy isn't easy for him to find. Thirdly, have I mentioned that he's a boy? <laughs> My husband brought up the fact that there are additional financial burdens having a child with additional needs. While there is some funding from the government to cover some early intervention, there are plenty of additional expenses, such as the cost of additional petrol and tolls, which costs us over $100 a week. Our Better Start funding from the government has run out at least two years too early, so any additional therapy we give William outside of Matilda Rose is expensive, particularly given that we only have one income coming in. All of the extra pressure that goes with having a child with special needs has also put added pressure on our marriage as well. I will always wish that I had been given the opportunity to reduce my risk of getting CMV when I was pregnant. Given that I am certain I would have adhered to a few additional behaviour modifications, I believe that I missed out on an opportunity to avoid contracting CMV in the first place. I had a 50% chance of preventing William from having congenital CMV. Instead, my son is deaf, he has mild cerebral palsy, moral, motor, oral, verbal dyspraxia, and moderate global developmental delay. While, Valgan, oh, while the treatment seems to help contain the live virus, I was gonna try and say that, but I'll leave that to <laughs> you experts. Uh, while, it, while it seems to help to contain the live virus and minimise the continued damage an unabated CMV virus causes, once a child's organs have already been damaged by CMV, there is no cure. There is an option for treatment and there is intervention. So until we have a vaccine that we can confidently use, I believe we need to make certain that every woman is aware of how to minimise their risk of contracting CMV <coughs> in the first place. Consider this, in Australia, work cover advises childcare facilities of preventative measures within a childcare centre for pregnant employees. And the National Health and Medical Research Council have guidelines for the prevention and control of infection in healthcare. So I believe that if we follow preventative care in one area, then the same <coughs> reasoning should also be true when considering women who are pregnant or trying to become pregnant.
I launched the Congenital CME Association of Australia with the vision to support families who have been affected, raise much needed awareness and help prevent CMV. I invite you to visit our new website, which should be up this afternoon or tomorrow, which has been launched. Become a member, follow us on Twitter, like our Facebook page, and keep us updated with your research. On behalf of the Global Collaborative of Congenital CMV Organisations, I am very excited to announce our Silver Awareness Ribbon. I would love to see you all wearing one to promote CMV awareness and have brought lapel pins here with me today. So please come and find me afterwards if you are interested in getting one and wear your silver. <laughs> For my family, well, we will continue to celebrate everything William can do and do everything in our power to help him and his three sisters reach their full potential. As difficult as it has been for me to accept the damage CMV has done to William, I am also very aware and thankful that he is doing as well as he is with all of the early, interve all of the early intervention provided to him. I am humbled with William's tenacity in the face of so many challenges. And I'm also humbled, as I know our situation, William's challenges could have been a great deal worse. To conclude, I'd like to read a quote from the modern version of the Hippocratic Oath. I will prevent disease whenever I can, for prevention is preferable to cure. I will prevent disease whenever I can, for prevention is preferable to cure. Thank you.